Please welcome. Please welcome. Welcome. This is another episode of the Defenders of Business Value podcast, a podcast where we talk about what makes a business valuable, learn the tips and tactics to increase your company's value that only veteran dealmakers know. And now here's your host, Ed Misogland. Mark Morgenstern. He is author, Soul of the Deal. And I've read lots of books. I've been, I've been, and I, I probably say it ad nauseum that you know, I've been in this business for 30 years and I've read lots of books. This is, I love this industry and I've never bumped into a book that, that, uh, about M&A that, that, uh, was, was so good than soul of the deal. It, it is at the top of the list for me. And, and Mark is, he delivered. He, oh my gosh, so many good, so many good things about, um, about doing deals, you know, not, not, not just the it, X's and O's go where they go, but this is a, as he says, deal jamming, deal jamming is about taking all of the pieces that go into a deal and it, there is no rules. It's just, you know, maybe it's going to take six weeks. Maybe it's going to take six months to do a deal. It doesn't matter. But what does matter is the parties that are involved and how they, how they operate. And, and one of the biggest takeaways I, I, I received today in this podcast was there's not a buyer and seller, they're counterparties and start behaving in that manner that we shouldn't be adversarial. Buyers, buyers are, are looking to minimize their, their risk. Sellers are looking to maximize their value. That's just the way it is, but we're not adversaries. We just have two different points of view. And Mark in this book is, it, it is absolutely dynamite. So I 100%, I, I know I say this a lot, but, but boy, each one of these podcasts um, builds on another and boy, he, he knocked it out of the park. So enjoy my conversation with Mark Morgenstern. So Mark, welcome to the show. It's great to have you. Well, thank you so much. It's a delight to be here. Well, I'll tell you, I, I am, I, I normally have my, my greatest challenge in the podcast has to do with introductions and I, it, and it, it, I just botch those up and, and I was hoping that you could just kind of give an overview of, of yourself and where this book came from. Okay. Well, Here's what's confusing and explaining my life to people. Which is, <laughs> normal human beings have consecutive careers. I did this, and then I did that, and then I did this. And what's hard to explain to people is I didn't have enough common sense to say no. So my careers were all concurrent. Okay. So the same time I was the managing partner of a law firm and a very active deal lawyer, I was also a real estate syndicator. I also started a real estate placement agent. I also started a venture fund. I also helped start Office Max. I, I don't know. I wrote a lot of articles. I did a lot of teaching. My wife, my view is I'm eclectic, right? Technology, real estate. My wife's view is I am unfocused. <laughs> <laughs> so aren't we, aren't we all? But but one way or the other, it's always focused around the early stage ecosystem. Okay. And. And every side of the ecosystem you can get. Well, the like I, I I was mentioning to you before we got started. I I I'm married to a therapist, and <clears throat> and I have all these you know play playbooks, all these books about you know how to do M and A and and valuation and and the technical side of things. And then out of nowhere comes the soul of the deal, and so I. I found this book and I, I love this book. So I, I am curious to know what, what possessed you to start writing from that angle? It wasn't because you, you clearly had the technical chops on, you know, this is how you do M and a, this is how you grow a business. This is how you scale, but this is different. This is a, an entirely different angle on, on, on the domain. So how did it get started? Well, let me start with one of the things I would hope that your listeners would be willing to consider. <clears throat> which is that I really do encourage people to listen like jam band musicians, not like lawyers. And I say it that way because remember, I was a lawyer. I managed law firms. This is, yeah. <laughs> I'm not dissing lawyers. They're trained as advocates. And if you tell a lawyer something, what typically happens? They tell you why you're wrong. 
They rebut you. They distinguish you. They deflate you. They deflect you. <laughs> but they don't say anything like, gee, that makes a lot of common sense. So if you contrasted that with, you know, the beginning of my book is Encyclopedia of Selling. The end is The Grateful Dead. Yeah. What do jam band musicians do? They're listening to engage. The guitarist is listening to what the bass player is saying. Hey, should I go there or not? Mm. The rhythm guitarist is trying to bridge the difference between what the bass is playing and the guitar is playing. The piano is trying to figure out how do I add color commentary to what's going on? It's a completely different form of listening. And mm. that form of listening, if you're doing deals, actually, if you're doing anything, is how you end up with productive dialogues. So the actual story of the book, which you intuited isn't normal because nothing I do is normal. <laughs> so through the years, I've done tons and tons of teaching at places like Wharton and the SEC and I don't know, MBA programs at Weatherhead, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Very academic, -y, very third party. And about six or seven years ago, I started was looking through my notes and said, you know, I have like 300 pages of notes here. Why don't I just stitch them together and make a book? So I did. Interesting. Right? A very academic -y, very relatively dry third-party book that's similar to things you've read. Mm -hmm. So I showed it to my, when I got done, it took me two years, showed it to my dad, 95 at the time. And he said, called me back. He said, Mark, this is brilliant. He said, no one's going to read it, but it's brilliant. <laughs> and I said, well, thank you very much. What are your thoughts, dad? He said, well, what's good in here are the maxims and the stories. Those are mm -hmm. really good. So you should write a book that's just maxims and stories. Okay, I don't know how to write a book, so I think, well, I'll take a maxim and I'll make each one a, a chapter heading, and then I'll tell the backstory. I'll have 30 or 35 chapters, and nice. if I'm almost sitting in a book, they can, okay. Two years, get it all done, show it to my children, both of whom I might add have MBAs, which is a problem for me. So they said, Dad, this is brilliant, but you can't write a business book this way. <laughs> I said, why not? They said, well, that's not how you do it. They have to have arcs. They have to have narratives. You've got to tell a story from the beginning to end. So the book you're looking at was driven by two things I did wrong, followed by a lot of advice. And then at the tag end, I had a couple of friends of mine who were reading it. And I said, hey, here's the last draft, guys. Anything you got to say, say it now. Mm. And they all sent it back and said, well, where are the key takeaways at the end of every chapter? I said, what are key takeaways? They said, well, that's what you have at every business book at the end of every chapter. <laughs> I said, well, I don't read business books. I didn't know that. <laughs> so key I wrote takeaways. <laughs> key takeaways. So the brilliant construct of this book, to be clear, <laughs> <laughs> not mine. Yeah. Well, you know, but but you're right. And there are so many. So I, I collect quotes and maxims and, and different things like that. And I and I and I'm showing my age and I dump them in Evernote. And, and at some point when I'm long gone, and my children find, you know, my my Evernote notes, they're going to see see that. And, and I mean, you literally could just cut and paste that back, you know, all of your little maxims and just paste them into into a document because they're all really really good and, and i i know later in the interview I, I i have a couple that i wanted to to ask you about but the but as you were as you wrote or as you were thinking of writing the book and i think there became you know the x's and o's are one thing but i think what resonated with me is that there there is so much more to getting this deal done. I, right now, I've got a I got an entire conference room with 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 attorneys and buyer with a buyer and a seller, and they're all like you said, they're the X's and O's are, are I don't want to say easy, but they're they're clear. But getting getting it across the the finish line was it. There is the, the emotional component to to doing so, and and I guess. Where I was heading with it is, I wanted to know how how did you how did you find that that each of each rep that you made each deal that you did there was that component and then you started stitching you know you said you had three hundred pages of of notes well what made you start taking those notes because there was there there was something that was hanging out there I was an American social history major in college. Really? <clears throat> which tells you a lot all by itself. I never took a business course. I never took an accounting course. I never took a tax course. I never took an econ course. So my view of life has always been 
hey, there's a lot of stuff that's like domain stuff in any domain, whether it's yeah. chemistry or it's M and A. <clears throat> and knowing that is sort of table stakes. Yeah. Of course, you have to know that. You have to master that. So what makes the difference, whether it's a band or it's a deal? And the answer is it's people. It has to be people. Yeah. I mean, logically, there is no other conclusion. So as I went through deals, and again, I'm pretty comfortable saying, you know, I wasn't born fully born from the loins of Zeus. I mean, I assure you, <laughs> I made a lot of mistakes. But when it was all done, being a history major, you look back and think, well, what did I do? What shouldn't I have done? What yeah. would have made a difference here? What would have made a difference there? And particularly what I would notice is something that somebody actually said to me two or three or four times that I did not understand what they were saying. Mm -hmm. I didn't have the common sense to say, hey, this is the third time you've said it. Yeah. It must be important to you. There's an implication there. I don't get the implication. So could you please spell it out for me and don't be afraid of insulting my intelligence because you can't. Just yeah. make sure I understand it, please. And if you go all the way back, that was the f pretty much the first thing you learned in selling encyclopedias. Right? How do you make any sale? Right? First, you find out what the customer wants to buy mm -hmm. and you sell it to them. And that's the order that you do it in. But many negotiators figure out what they want and they sell, trying to sell their counterparty what they want yeah. without ever finding out what the counterparty wants and why they want it. And, and, I, and I think that's, that is, you know, especially the smaller the business, the, the harder it is to sell. And I, I don't think that the businesses are positioned in a, in a manner that they, they can, like you said, that, 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 that they can sell to that person, to who, whoever's next. There, there's not, there's not. Other than an earning stream, no one, I mean, it's, it's, you know, how do I replace you? You know, whereas up upstream, it seems as though that you, you've got so many, so many different layers that offset the, the micro business owner. You know what I mean? Yes. But it's the smaller the business, the, the more the business is simply the founder, mm -hmm. right? The, the less there is to sell because you're not buying the founder. And, and there are two ends to that problem. What is the founder going to do the day after they sell the business, which is pretty confusing. Right. And the buyer is trying to figure out, well, if a founder isn't there, is there a business? Right. No, 100 percent. And the funny thing is that as you, you know, there was a, a study done that, I mean, 76 percent of, of business owners that sell their business regret selling it. Because, you know, they, they've lost their identity. They've lost, you know, what what it was that got them up in the morning. So. I, I'm with you. You um, deal empathy. You you cite that a lot, and I'm just I'm I'm just curious to know how to, you know, how do you find that mutual ground? Because I think, you know, when, you know, as you know, I mean, when you when you start down the path of of doing a deal, you now have it's an adversarial because. You, as a buyer, you're you're looking under the hood. You're you're doing the due diligence colonoscopy, and there's a lot of scrutiny that I don't believe business owners are used to. And conversely, you know that business owner or that business buyer has had hundreds of reps of looking at other deals, and you're and the seller is totally outgunned. So so they begin right out of the gate with a with you know with an adversarial relationship. So how do you bridge that? Well, let's start with some vocabulary, which is why I don't like the construct of people being adversaries. I don't like the concept of the other side. I don't like the enemy. And you'll notice in the book, I consistently describe the people as counterparties. Absolutely. Counterparties is neutral, right? And mm -hmm. a buyer can't get their business bought, can't buy a business if the seller doesn't want to sell it. And the seller can't sell it if the buyer doesn't want to buy it. So they're counterparties. And I look at it that they're all trying to get to the same place at the scale of the business. So we're not enemies. And why wouldn't I have empathy and real empathy? I'll, I'll tell you part of the, the distinction I make is there's a really, really good book by Chris Voss, which I'm sure you've read. Sure. Split <laughs> right? the difference. Never split the difference. FBI mm -hmm. hostage negotiator. 
um, really, to me, sort of paved the way for a, a different level of thinking about the human emotion involved. Yeah. And here's the limitation of it. What he was describing when he was describing bonding and rapport, he's talking about a hostage negotiator and a kidnapper. Now, how much do we think they're really going to have empathy for each other? <laughs> right. We're not. And so I think what he talks about is creating what I think of as tactical empathy. It sounds like empathy. It sounds like I care. Do you like the New York Yankees? But the negotiator is trying to find any reason to humanize the kidnapper and relate to them. But you can, and you can do that if you only have to sustain that for three hours or six hours or 24 hours. But if you take that approach to empathy of a deal that's going to take months, it doesn't work. It's a crocodile smile. Everybody will see right through it. So the concept is right, but it's not deep enough. So how do you get sustainable deal empathy? Well, all I can tell you is I've literally never talked to anyone that at some, particularly asking their life story, but then say, wow, that's really interesting. You did this, you did that. You hate the Yankees, great. <laughs> I hate the Yankees too. All right thinking people hate the Yankees. But if you're talking with people, you find the things you have in common first. And if you find them, then you each become a human being to the other. And once you become a human being and you're sort of trying to, you're trying to get along, you're not, you're, you're saying, hey, you know what? I understand what you're saying. I can't accommodate it. Mm -hmm. I completely understand what you're saying. And if I were sitting where you're sitting, I would say the same thing. So instead of saying yeah. you're stupid or it's wrong or rejecting it, you're, you're, you're literally yeah. empathizing. You're saying, hey. If I were looking through your eyes, that makes a lot of sense. Uh -huh. Well, I'll tell you, what, one of the things, uh, to piggyback off the Chris Voss um, book, and I think it's probably saved a lot of deals, is, you know, when he said, you know, how am I, help me understand how I'm supposed to do that. And, and that, that forces the counterparty to share, you know, you know what? That's true. You pro you probably can't make this work. <laughs> so and, and and if you reframe the way he said it, what he's really saying is, I'd be happy to accommodate your request, but you have to be able to tell me how it can be accommodated. You can't put the burden on me. So you tell nice. me, and yeah. we'll see if that works together. And by the way, I being Chris Voss for a second here. You know, one of my maxims, as you know, is exploration is not commitment. So in Chris Voss is saying, hey, I'm willing to explore it. I can't commit to it because I don't understand it, but I'm very willing to explore it. And the second that you validate people, you acknowledge that their question has meaning. You've gone a long way again toward bonding with them. OK, this person's not rejecting me. They're acknowledging what I'm saying. I, I like people who acknowledge me. And I feel a little more kindly towards you. And that creates what I call social lubricant, emotional deal glue, you know, things mm -hmm. that yeah. get you closer to together than farther right. apart. Interesting because, you know, and, and I'm certain you've seen sellers that have done things for buyers that, that defy all logic only because of the relationship that they've established. And conversely, I'm certain you've seen sellers scuttle deals just for the sake of, I really don't, I really don't like you anymore, you know? And, you know, again, one of my maxims, which sometimes people think is simplistic, but it really isn't simplistic. It's simple. <clears throat> people like to do business with people they like to do business with. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when you're picking a dry cleaner, Ed, you know, do you pick the dry cleaner because it's the lowest possible price with the least possible convenience or do you go someplace where when you walk in they smile at you yeah. and feel good that you went there yeah you yeah. like to do business with people you like to do business with but you do well it seems it seems anymore especially like the you know i know quality of earnings have, have been going on for mm -hmm. forever in a day and and but it seems as though that it's becoming more and more prevalent and it's, it's moving further further down downstream and I, I think there's a, there's starting to be a, um, you know, that third party that's coming in to be that bad guy. And I'm trying, and I'm trying to formulate the question because I, as you were talking, 
you know, it's one thing when you and I as counterparties are talking, and it's another thing when you get a third party that comes in here and, and, and is serving as the bad guy. And I'm just curious to know your take on, as you continue, you know, you, you get these, these specialists that are being dropped in, whether it's appraiser or Q of E or whomever, how do you keep, keep that deal empathy together? You know what I mean? Are you on the buy side, the sell e- side? Either, or- either or take it. Play. <clears throat> so it depends how you present the expert and why you're presenting them. So the quality of earnings is almost always introduced by the buyer. Mm-hmm. Right. So but we, we, we can guess the point of the quality of earnings is to point out that right? there isn't any. <laughs> it, Therefore, the business is worth less. So the experts being brought in to buttress the point of the buyer. You could probably, as the buyer, say to the seller, hey, I'm not telling you this is the only answer or the only thing. I'm saying to you, this is kind of objective reality. This is how the marketplace uses information. I'm introducing it here because it may let you see your business a little differently. It'll help me see your business differently. And then maybe we'll have a common vocabulary going forward. That's pretty empathetic. Yeah. It doesn't say, hey, it's quality of earnings is $2. That's all it is. Two times three is six. I can pay you $6. Whole different gig. Yeah. Well, and and I and I hope the listeners from this podcast pick that up because I I think that's I think that's what it you're using a Q of E mercenary coming in and and being the bad guy and trying to preserve your relationship and and from where I sit I'm I I just don't think that that's a I don't think. I, I think your hit ratio will increase if if you just slow down and, and describe it in a manner that you did. You know what I mean? You know, it's it's a variable. It's a factor. It's it's just a thing. It's sort of like when people on the other side tell me, well, Mark, that's not market. I say, well, okay, if you were buying this from the market, that's really the, the positive, but you're buying it from me. So what I agree to is the market. Right. <laughs> thank, thank you for sharing the market view with me. I just don't care. <laughs> it, I, I just I, before you came on, I was I just saw that because um, I was I was thinking about that. And, you know, because um, I'm a I'm a business valuation guy. I've, I've been a valuation guy for for years. And and I no matter I always preference. No, I, if this piece of paper that I'm giving you means nothing. The market is the market. And, and through a process, we'll determine the market. And I can tell you how I believe the, the market will behave toward this investment. But at the end of the day, you know, there, you're part of that market and so is the buyer. And that, that's the term is it. Well, you, you and I seem to, as counterparties, we agree to that. You would be surprised at <laughs> how many people don't. <laughs> oh, oh, my goodness. Um, time kills all deals. and. I'm just curious to know, um, because you said that time kills all deals and, and deals aren't over until they're over. So what is over in your world? <clears throat> in my world, literally, it means to me when the pieces of paper have been signed, the money has been wired and I've received it and I can access it because until then, I don't think it's over. Mm-hmm. And in one of the stories, every, every story in the book, as you know, is true. I mm-hmm. changed industries and names and geographies, but every story is true. <clears throat> and one of them is a, a loan deal, which I'll make this much shorter for your audience. But we were refinancing a, a company. We were giving the lenders better terms because we had, we had reasons to do that. It benefited us. Mm-hmm. And so the lenders were delighted. And there was no particular hurry in getting it done because it meant that we were going to pay higher interest rate. So no urgency on either side. Closing got postponed a couple of times because the lenders, some one of the lenders wanted to be there and couldn't be there. So finally, it's now the actual closing day. And this is almost minute by minute true. Started closing documents at eight o'clock in the morning. And one of the shareholders signed for like an hour. Then the second, because they had to sign guarantees and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. The second shareholder signed for about another hour for them himself. Then there was another two hours in which um, 
the CEO signed on behalf of the company. So we might have been there for like three or four hours and all we've done have been signing documents. And then there was a lead bank, the syndicate lead. So the lead bank has to sign all the documents. And now there are exactly two things that have to happen. There are two other banks. They each need to sign a one page piece of paper that says, hey, the syndicate leader is the syndicate leader. I agree to it. I'm buying $2 million of this loan. Okay, two pieces of paper. Lender number one, lender number two, technically two, signs it. And that last lender picks up the pen. So their pen is, what, four inches, five inches from the piece of paper? And they start to sign it. And just then someone comes in the room and say to this lender, hey, I'm really sorry, but there's an urgent call for you. <laughs> the guy says, I've been sitting here for four hours with nothing to do. <laughs> the person says, it's really urgent. Just put the pen down, come back. Lender goes away, shorten the story up a lot. 30 minutes later, comes back. The chairman of the bank had just revoked their authority to sign the loan. This deal had been going on for five months. It was better for all the banks. Every document had been negotiated. Every document had been agreed to. Every oh, single party had signed it except for the single last signature. So... <laughs> Deals are over when they're over, and they're not over until they're over. And the reason a lot of deals fall apart on the sell side is the seller starts thinking the deal is over, and they start spending all the money they're going to get, and they right. start spending all the time they're going to get, and they start getting careless, and they don't come into work at 8 in the morning because it's somebody else's business. They come in at 1030. There's a problem, and they don't address it. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. All of those things start getting deals to drift. Yeah. And once they start drifting, they're very hard to get back together. Well, and the funny thing is that you, you, they turn around and and, all, and the buyer, rightfully so, says, you know, why don't we, why don't we take a look at the, the last three months financial statement? And and now all of a sudden you've got there, – there's basis for, you know, I don't want to say retrade, but there's basis for conversation. Well, you, you – Time allows buyers to develop buyer's remorse. Mm. You're selling encyclopedias. The rule is very simple. Sign the contract, get the check, leave the house. <laughs> <laughs> Don't give people time to think. You're done. Close the deal. Because every second you haven't closed the deal. Listen, I had deals that were closing. You ready for this? On September 12th of 2001. That'll be a problem. Like know how many of those deals closed? Yeah. None. Yep. Not me, not buyer, not actually one of them is going public, but it was the external universe mm. changed. Yep. And I'm subject to the external universe just like everybody else is. Yep. Well, speaking of speed, yeah. so you, you, you introduced the concept of urgency accelerator. So can you provide a, you know, kind of a, a an, an example of, of what an urgency accelerator is? <clears throat> well, I can do it. First, I'll just do it in the consumer world because you've all experienced it. Every time you go on Amazon, right? You go on Amazon. I know you go on Amazon. Everybody goes on Amazon. I live on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I ordered, a, I ordered a heating pad yesterday at 5 o'clock. It was at my house at 730. But when you go on Amazon, what does it show you? Um, one-time limited sale. Uh, quantity mm-hmm. left in stock, one. Um, you know, prime day only, then prices revert to a higher price. Uh, you go by a carpet store going out of business. The same carpet store has been going out of business for 40 years. But what's the message? Well, if you don't hurry, if you don't act now, the prime day sale will be over. If there's only one left in stock, it will be gone and you can't buy it. Now I've given you an urgent reason to act. If I go out of business, yep. the carpets aren't there to buy them. So those in the consumer world are urgency. And in the, in the deal world, it more translates to, listen, we've been chatting for a while and I've really enjoyed it. Um, not just trying to share some information here, but I, I guess word has gotten out that you're getting really close to trying to buy me. And so some other people are poking around. And, and for the moment, I'm not really answering their call. But, you know, if we don't get this done, like in two or three days, then I don't know, maybe... Maybe uh, my spouse will make me take those calls. What do you think? <laughs> I see that that that's a good example. Yeah. Um. I um. I wanted to ask you 
two more questions. I wanted to ask you the, the common mistakes or misconceptions that business owners make in doing deals um, and how, and how to, how to avoid them. And where's, where is the, you know, where's the speed bump that you know that you're, you're probably heading in the wrong direction. On a, so here, you know, you, you said in some other context, Ed, quite correctly that for sellers, it's frequently like a one-time event. It's the only time in their life that they've done it. Right? Maybe they sold a house, maybe they didn't, but they mm-hmm. probably never sold a business. And if you think about selling a house, which many people have done, not everyone has done, but many people, what's the common fallacy of a homeowner selling a house? My house is the best house on the street because and then fill in the blank. Yep. My tree lawn is wider. My trees are taller. My windows are cleaner. My driveway is longer. <laughs> or more to the point, it's my house. Yep. And if it's my house, it's worth more than every other house just because it's my house. So everybody overvalues their own assets. They don't do it intentionally. You know, it's a, sure. like many forms of confirmation bias. You see what you want to see. Right. So mm-hmm. you, all you see are the good things. What does the buyer see frequently? Well, they see all the warts on the frog. They don't see the frog. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. you keep thinking the princess is about to kiss you and boom. So how you get a realistic evaluation, which is, by the way, why somebody talks to you or talks mm-hmm. to an experienced attorney or an experienced accountant. And what they can share with a business owner is, hey, You're welcome to think about your business any way you want to while you own it, but you need to at least understand how other people look at it and things that don't bother you will bother them. And here's not just what they will be bothered by, but why it will bother them and why that's a legitimate concern. You can assuage it, but you can't pretend it's not a legitimate concern. That's interesting because, you know, it seems as though, you know, I've, I've, I've been in this field for a, a long time. And, and I, I, I'm starting to see people doing these market study assessments, you know, where they're, they're basically pre-selling, they're going out total anonymity, hire somebody to, to, to find out who's buying and why, and, and finding out those, finding those, those warts and, and all, and like I said, basically a pre-sale and, and do you do you see that? Is that a is that a real thing? Because it you know it, it seems as though here in Indiana we it takes a little bit of time for for things to trickle into the middle here. So do you see that or no? Well, what I see, which is the equivalent of it, is there are more and more sites where you can sort of put in anonymous information mm-hmm. and get in effect almost an auction type reaction to it. So without actually putting your business on the market technically. Interesting. Right? And And one of the things in a digital world is people will not be as bound by living in Indianapolis as they are today. Right. They'll be able to get much broader data sets. There's a sort of corollary of that, which is part of what I've been teaching about this month is small business owners generally, and small can mean anything below like a hundred million dollars at this point, right? Small doesn't mean $122. The world of generative AI is moving so quickly. And it is impacting every single business, whether they really understand it or not. So what I've been saying to businesses, I'm Simon, um, as you know, I'm also a part-time partner in a venture fund at UC Berkeley. I Mm helped mentor the AI accelerator there this summer. So I'm lot of looking at the front end of some of this stuff. So the question I've been asking everybody is, well, are you going to use AI and will it change your business? The answer is, well, sure, I'm looking at it because it'll do whatever it's going to do. Do you think your customers are doing anything? Well, sure, they're doing the same thing. Oh, that's interesting. So if you're changing and they're changing, why would you expect the value proposition in between to remain static? (laughs) Because that would not be obvious to me. And by the way, you currently think of your competitors as being your legacy competitors, the people you've always competed with. I'm going to respectfully suggest to you that your real competitor is a startup that isn't burdened by legacy, that is starting as a, as a Gen AI native, and they're going to be competing with you for your customer, and you can't even see them yet. Interesting. And by the way, let me just one more thing out on that. Which, yeah, unbelievable. So to me, the whole concept of quality of earnings in a Gen AI universe, 
I question more than I ever have because I just don't think the past is as good a predictor of the future as it's ever been. You know, it's funny you say that because I, I just interviewed um, uh, a fellow by the name of Brett Gaines from uh, his, his company's Loomis Data. And they are supporting SBA lenders and they only need like six pieces of not not with the business. They, they need the business name, I think, or, or I'm sorry, the business SIC code. And they can they can predict default rates with six pieces of, of information. They they pull all this information, whether it's uh, unemployment in the area, um, you know, default rates from the SBA and they compile it. And they are doing. They are able to support that SBA lender and saying, you know, this, this is this is as good of like in his in the podcast we talked about. You know, this Jimmy John's franchise is every bit as as financeable and a good deal for the bank as that dental practice. And and so I'm with you. I it's it's gonna I. I'm I'm looking forward to putting the hammer down and and uh, seeing what these next twenty years look like, especially with AI. Oh, it's going to be it's going to be fun, interesting, and challenging. <laughs> Amen to that. Um, deal jamming. Yeah, I have. Yeah, let's talk deal jamming. Uh, it's who are the who are the participants in the deal jam? So let's start with go back to a stage for a second, right? Okay. Remember, other than encyclopedia selling and playing music and following the dead, it's all to me. It's all part of the same theme. On stage in a deal jam. Well, let me, let me do a contrast quick. So, have you ever been to a Rolling Stones concert? I have. Okay. Have you ever been to a Grateful Dead concert? I have, and I've been with the John Mayer side. Okay, that's it's all good. But here's the point: if you go to a Rolling Stones concert. These are really, really good musicians, brilliant songwriters, and they know their audience. They know their customer. So what do they do every night? If, if they went on the road for 100 dates and you saw 100 of them, you'd pretty much see the same show every night. The same songs in the same order. It might be two minutes and 42 seconds one night and three minutes another night. You know, Keith Richards might play an extra 12 bars or not. Jagger might prance around a little longer or not. But fundamentally, it is the same thing every night done slightly better or slightly worse. If you were following the Grateful Dead, they never played the same song on consecutive nights. If you saw them 100 nights, you would probably not see the same song twice. Right. If you heard it once, it might be three minutes. If you heard it second time, it might be 33 minutes. So deal jamming is you're starting with a basic structure and then you're following it where tonight's audience, tonight's band, Tonight's mood takes it. Interesting. And that's the approach to a deal, which is, Jerry Garcia has a great sentence, which I'll, I'll paraphrase badly, but it's essentially that as a musician, you fall into an auto trap of familiarity. Interesting. No. Okay. So you yeah. start to play three notes and your brain says, hey, I know what comes after those three notes. It's this fourth note. Well, you start to do a deal. Well, you've done this, in your case, you've done this deal 52 times. So you know what you're expecting, and therefore you see what you're expecting. A deal jammer says, I have no idea what's going to happen here. I'm going to listen to hear how this sure. deal could unfold. And I don't have to win every variable. I have to win enough of the variables that it's a good deal. But it could be variable 1, 2, and 10. It could be 3, 4, 6, and 12. Interesting. Yeah. I'm jamming. I'm working with real people in real time in a real set of circumstances. It doesn't have to be the same. Interesting. So, yeah, you're saying that, and, and I'm sitting here going, you know what? I, you know, you've got the pentatonic scale. You got 12 notes. How how do you want to put them together in order to get the deal done? And there's there are no rules. No. Nope. Right. Interesting. Well, you know, I came out of school and. And I have been, I, I wanted to be an investment banker and I got into this brokerage world and I've never left. So this is 30 years of, of, of being in this environment. And so I am so glad that I bumped into you. Um, oh my goodness. It, I want to, like I said, in my invite, I want to be you when I grow up because oh, my goodness. I'd like to be me if I ever grew up, but <laughs> I've given up on growing up. <laughs> Good for you. And I, I hope you, I hope you never do, but uh, I do. 
I always ask of my guests, kind of our last question is, you know, what would you, if you had one thing that you could share, you know, that would have the greatest impact for value and saleability, what would, what would that one piece of advice be? Rigorous honesty with yourself hmm. about who you are and what you have rigorous attempt to understand what the buyer will acquire and because you know your business better than anyone else if you really understand what they want to buy you can present and shape what you're selling to conform to what they want to buy if you treat every buyer as if they are the same you will present the same thing every time and you'll miss the opportunity ask every question you can of the buyer why are you talking to me what about my business interests you? What other businesses you ever looked at? Why did you look at them? Why didn't you do them? Ask, 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 why, 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 before you open your mouth and say anything. Oh my goodness. That's a, that is so good. Ah, and, and, and at the same time, it, it, it builds that empathy that you talked about right out of the gate. So I'll have all your contact information in, in the show notes. Um, and I, I, I am so grateful. I, I, you know, there's, there's been, yeah, I think we're, I'm recording. I think this is like 120 or something like that. And man, I, I have to tell you, I have loved our time together. It has been nothing but great. So I, I appreciate it. I know you don't have a lot of time and I know I'm, you know, I'm, I'm envious of you being on the board at the rock and roll hall of fame. I'm, I'm, I'm envious of a lot of things you're doing. So I'm, but I'm grateful for the time you spent with me because I know you don't have a lot of it. So thanks again. This was very fun. I enjoyed it. I knew I would. This was another episode of the Defenders of Business Value Podcast. For more episodes packed with strategies to increase the value of your business, visit DefendersOfBusinessValue.com for show notes, transcripts, and free tools to start you on your journey. Subscribe now so you don't miss any future episodes.